Where do we go from here? You print the story. And we get a few days off. No. You're going back on the road. Oh, for Pete's sake, Dave, we just got home. You wanted to tell me a story. Okay, I buy. But I don't buy half the story. I want the whole thing. You say co-ops have helped to solve some of today's problems. All right. I want you to go out and keep in touch with the co-op movement. I want you to find out what they're doing about other problems. The co-op people seem to have a workable pattern. They know that a business made up of themselves, run by themselves, and for their service, isn't only a true expression of democracy, but it's also a practical way of maintaining a better way of life. If you're right, and I think you are, co-ops are people. And the future of the cooperative movement is as unlimited as the imagination and initiative of the people. I have the feeling that democracy is a way of living. I think the world is both overpopulated and overcentralized, and it's necessary to, in order to get rid of a sick society, it's necessary for people to become organized in groups that are and sufficiently manageable so that they have some feeling of significance. Not much is said about the cops that no longer exist. I think that that's a problem because we can learn a lot from the cops that failed or uh, naturally devolved into something else. And um, we could hopefully learn from those lessons, take something away from that. Spontaneous interest and in, uh, participation of people at the bottom is the essence of um, a healthy society. I came f from a family that had a lot of cooperative agendas. My father was instrumental in starting the first cooperative in Wausau, uh, my hometown. And um, I went to uh, cooperative youth camps and uh, <laughs> I don't know when I was in high school. The co-op movement came to Wisconsin long before the first housing co-op had been formed in Madison. Agricultural cooperatives were established in rural districts to help small farmers share costs and equipment, enabling them to compete with larger scale farms. The cost of sharing equipment was much cheaper than if each farmer had tried to buy all their own machinery. A cooperative could work in a similar way to provide low cost housing through sharing living expenses and resources. It was a short time after the University of Wisconsin began admitting women that some of those women realized how difficult it could be to pay for their own housing. Women were expected to work in the home. Those women who didn't come from wealthy families couldn't afford to be in sororities and found it difficult to manage. The first housing co-ops in Madison that I'm familiar with started in the early 1900s, the teens, and they were women's co-ops that were started by the university to house women who were some of the first women to be students at the university, and um, most of the housing in the whole you know, campus area was geared towards men. In 1915, a group of seven women students went to the Dean of Women, Lois Kimball Matthews, with the idea of starting a new cooperative house. 
Mortar Board, the UW Women's Scholarship Group, became interested and helped the group, grown to 11, to start their house. A house at 433 North Warren was rented from the university, and the first housing cooperative in Madison was born. Mortarboard was such a success that in 1916 the senior women's organization Blue Dragon started another co-op, the Blue Dragon Inn, next door. This same year, yet another women's house was begun by the Association of Collegiate Alumni and was called ACA Cottage. Little is known about how these houses were run, but they did refer to themselves as cooperatives. It appears from what little information exists that money was saved by sharing and cleaning in some of their housework, by buying food and paying for servants as a group, and by having the UW, who gave them cheap rent, as a landlord. In 1919, the university decided to build a new medical center on the location of the three co-ops. The houses were demolished and the displaced women joined together to form Tabard Inn at 444 North Charter. Only a few years later, university expansion once again drove them from their home, and around 1924 the group bought a house at 115 North Orchard, under the auspices of the newly created University Women's Building Corporation. The UWBC was the beginning of Madison's first co-op system. Its purpose was to accumulate capital and buy property for women's cooperative houses. The idea of creating a corporation to buy houses for cooperatives was to bring some permanence to the co-op movement. Members were no longer renting property and paying a landlord. Their co-op was outright buying their house. The rent members paid went towards paying off a mortgage. The corporation owned the house, though members could come and go. Conceivably, the mortgage could be paid off and the members would have only maintenance and services to pay for. If they had rented the property, they would always be paying rent to a profit-making landlord, and their house could at any moment be taken away from them by the owner. Unfortunately for the members of the UWBC, they were still under the thumb of the UW Board of Regents, and they were vulnerable to UW expansion. The concept did make the co-ops more self-sustaining, though, and it would be used by future co-ops to gain total independence from the UW and landlords. Tabard Inn was named after the inn in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales and was said to be a house for the high type of girl who is limited financially. Details about Tabard's culture are more well documented than those of the earlier houses. In the early years, nearly all the housework was done by the members of the co-op. Four women did the cooking and even financial work was done by members. Later, under the guidance of the university, staff were hired to manage the co-op, cook the meals, and do maintenance. Members did an average of four hours of work per week for their house. Most of this work consisted of cleaning the house, setting the table, serving meals, raking leaves, and shoveling snow. Members of the house were required to keep their grades up or they could be kicked out. A house mother assigned to the house by the university lived with the women and made sure the rules were obeyed. But the house culture wasn't always nose to the grindstone and getting chores done together. The house truly was like a small community 